Hello all and thank you that you are joining this talk. I will talk today about the possibility of uh, the cluster deployment tool Werewolf, which is a very old and a very versatile tool and under hybrid development at the moment. Now coming to the first point, what now exactly is Werewolf for? It is a simple, scalable, stateless, stateless, and a very flexible operating system uh, oper uh, system to provision operating systems to compute nodes. So, in the sense of high performance computing, where you have a cluster of several hundred or several thousand nodes, you have the problem that you to get the operating system in the same version to all the nodes and configure them all at once. Um, and that uh, Werewolf is now exactly the system which is used for this. Um, the special features of Werewolf in this case, it's really very lightweight. So this means that the operating system images are around one or two gigabyte or even smaller. The nodes are stateless, which means we do not install that operating system to the disk. We just keep it in memory. With high performance compute nodes, you have lots of memory. Mostly the, the systems have 64, 128 gigs of memory, mostly. So this means if you are pushing one, two gigabytes of the operating system to the memory, that does not really matter. Um, a new feature of Werewolf now is that it's agnostic to the operating system, which means um, we have the, the operating system on which the um, Werewolf system runs and then the operating system on which the nodes runs. And we get the operating system on which the nodes run, on which the node runs as a container. We import them at a container, then we push them out to the node. So this means um, you can run your master with an OpenSUSE, and if you want to test if CentOS or Roki is fast, you simply pull that container, push it out to the nodes, do your tests, decide what happens, and then you can push the old operating system again. Also, um, it's a very flexible deployment system because we are using Go templates for the configuration files which means that you can really, if you say, okay, the guys who wrote this did not, um, re did not have this special feature for my special hardware I have, I need a configuration file for the nodes. You can simply write this Go template and then push it out to the nodes and then you are done. And um, as it's in our product, it's definitely open source as every cool things are. Now, as I mentioned, um, what are really HPC systems? HPC means high performance computing, and this is at the moment always based on compute clusters. The clusters have some nodes, so some, there are some institute, small institute clusters, and you have very big ones with 1,000, 100,000, and even more nodes. They are all at the moment, all of the top 500, which is the list of the of the um, of the biggest and greatest compute clusters at the moment, they are all running on Linux. Um, they are mostly based on start standard hardware, except they are using um, high performance network devices like InfiniBand or other things. Um, they have accelerator cards but this but these are most likely gpus and they are placed at big um, labs um, state labs like the um, like in Jülich or at universities or things like this now about the linux systems which are used the system is always most likely installed by the manufacturer so you order that cluster at a company and then they will install your linux on it they put some own secret sauce on it. Um, and for example, one of the uh, Gray who is selling big clusters is uh, it's D based. Um, CentOS and Rookie is the quasi standard for these clusters, um, which is not really a surprise because Rookie and CentOS have their roots in the HPC business. Um, 
Debian based this system are not, not, not collaborable um, in, HPC, in the HPC world because they are missing the drivers which you need for the high performance networks. Now, what's now the HPC stack? How do we deploy the system? The systems are always installed and are running on bare metal and also all the simulation stuff. Um, there is no virtualiz virtualization because um, you would lose some of your performance and this means if you lose some of your performance and you are simply buying to do the system to get the highest performance, this would not work out. Um, this also means that virtualization does not really is necessary because virtualization is there to split up a node in several resources. But in H the HPC world, it's the other way around. You have one binary running on multiple nodes. So there is no really sense of this. Um, there is also a kind of own container solution for the HPC world, which is um, a tainer, where you then can kind of um, create in your environment your binary and then push it on the nodes. Yeah, nodes also other also other deployment system, um, so other ones like XCAT um, are also using um, pushing out images to the nodes. So stateful installation of um, high performance computing system, the nodes, um, it's really the exceptions. You are not really not that often doing it. You also always need the system always needs to get control of the DHCP and the um, and the DNS so that you get your name resolution in a proper way and you are always doing a network network boot because you want to um, if you want to reinstall systems you do not want to go to um, 1000 nodes and push your ESO to it or your memory stick or something like this. Um, we also always have to keep in mind that we cannot fully rely on DHCP because we have unusual network topologies and also InfiniBand um, to be configured and this could not be done by DHCP. Now, yeah, I'm talking about Werewolf 4. So there is the successor. There is Werewolf 3. It's also a success, very successful solution and it's widely used. It's in the OpenHPC um distribution or uh, open hpc is a kind of meta distribution where you can use um or it's a hpc stack based either on sendos rookie or on suse or, or on um open suse leap at the moment um the web of free had always an overhead in the in the has, yeah, um, when you try to modify it because you have to we had to keep in mind that it was storing its configuration in different storage backends and this did not always work properly uh, this did not always work out properly um, it also transported it on busy books and uh, there was always a, was a problem with the uh, licensing and the hardest thing at it at that time when Rebel 3 was written there was no real concept of how to provide um, images. Uh, so you had to provide your own mechanism to create really a, con a image which you then can push to the node. So you had to run super into a change root, install there, compress it back, and then send it out. And so you had to provide your own kind of sources or um, of repository lists and things for your operating system and you weren't unable, for example, if you were running on Leap, you could not really create um, a rookie image or Debian image or something like that. So, and that's the reason because now the, the, the time has changed and we have now many tools to create images on in the container world with builder and all this kind of stuff. There was a decision um, that to leverage this kind of advances in the um, in the container from the containers, and to use these containers 
to push them and uh, or you, to use these containers as installation media. Now, who started Vavo 4? This was HPC and G, or so HPC Next Generation and CIQ. They also um, um, invented or, or, or developed Aptainer, which is this kind of uh, container solution for HPC, and they are also um, connected to CentOS Rookie. Short history. Now, if you install Werewolf, what else do you need on your system to deploy um, your, your cluster? So you need this Werewolf D service, which you always need to, to, to push out the containers and the overlays, which is the config of the nodes to the compute nodes. You need a separate DFTP server, which is used to start IPXE. You need the HCP so that you that your network boot really works, and um, yeah, and what's also inside and that's uh, WW control. So this is the config interface that you config the node, you config the, the IP addresses and all this kind of stuff. What you can also do with Vermove is a SSH key distribution, and you can also um, manage the NFS server on your so that you can easily share um, file systems to your nodes. Now I talked about the operating system container and this is the really operating system which then runs on the compute node. The operating system container is the base operating system for the compute node and it's really completely independent on what you use on your um, host OS. It needs to be or it should be the same architecture if you want to modify it in a proper way. Um, if it's not, it can be still deployed. So you could pull um, an ARM container on a x86 host and then push it out to an ARM host. Um, the boot image from which the host then boots is not really a container. It's derived from the container because the Linux kernel simply doesn't know what to do with a container. So if you import a container into Werewolf 3, uh, Werewolf 4, um, it's unpacked to a rootfs and then compressed to a CPIO archive. And this CPIO archive is then pushed as initRD to the compute nodes. Now, the interesting thing is how do you really get the container? And there are, for example, in the OpenSUSE registry, there are containers which you can simply pull and then you can immediately boot your, compu uh, your compute node. There are leap containers and there's also tumbleweed containers if you want to test the newest kernel for it, for example. You can also use Docker or Builder or Kiwi to create your own rootfs container and then import it directly into Werewolf if you want to do it on your own. Um, now, container modification, you can, because it's a change root image on your Werewolf host, um, you can still modify it. You should only do it to, for example, to install additional packages or drivers, like you pull the container from the registry, then there's Definitely no NVIDIA driver on it. So you need an NVIDIA driver to address your CUDA GPUs for, for scientific um, computation. So it would shell into the container at the NVIDIA repos, install it there, shell out of the container or leave the container, then the complete image is built and then you simply boot them and then you have the NVIDIA driver and all that stuff on the nodes. There's also a comment for it. There we go. Now, how is the, the con, how do we really manage the configuration? And that's the, that's the thing you need, really need to, it, it's not like in the uh, cloud images, um, where you pull all your configuration through ignition or this all, or combustion, all this stuff, because, um, some hardware devices really need static configuration files. And this, for example, InfiniBand or also kind of exotic hardware also, we, 
you are using a high performance file system, then you always have to distribute sometimes the configurations and that's not easy to get them dynamically. So you need this static configuration files and for that we are using the overlays. So uh, overlay is a, is a CPO archive and this is put on top of the CPO archive you get from the container where you so where your operating system inside and then on top of this we put the additional configuration which which includes the network configuration and all the other stuff you need there. Um, this overlay archive is then extracted on the node and it's node specific so it's generated for every node and we are using Go templates for that so you have really um, a lot of versatility to get the variables we have in variables out the configuration files. We have two kind of overlays. It's the one is called the system overlay and this gets immediately applied to the node. So there's the network config and all this kind of stuff in there. It's never ever updated. And so it should contain the network configuration. So it's it's even applied. So it's a feature of IPXE that it can combine several CPO archives to one big CPO archive and then boot from it. And that's the system overlay. So that's then the operating system where we boot from. And then we also have a runtime overlay, which is then updated at regular, uh, at regular intervals so that we can also have some kind of dynamic configuration if you want to change things and not reboot the whole cluster then you could put them this kind of changes or things into a runtime overlay. Um, now I spoke about this now how does it really look like? Um, So, for example, we also use the overlays on the to configure the configuration files which we have on the host, which is running Werewolf. So that we what, for example, the because we also manage NFS, we can manage the, the etc exports or etc host, and of course the etc uh, dhcp.conf, so that all these things really go out in a proper proper way. Now, how does it really look like such a template? It's really you have this this um, go template syntax where you have your variables and then they are on overlay creation they are replaced so you can also loop over for example several network devices which you always have in a cluster it, you always have your your kind of normal network then you have your infiniband network then you also have all the time you have to configure ipmi and this kind of stuff and here is the template for the issue that you if you connect a monitor to the node that you immediately know which node this is, which is not always that easy to find out. If you have a rack full of nodes, you want to know which really IP address is on it. That's how the overlays look like. Um, now, I spoke about the variables we have in Valve, and that's um, a really core feature here, is that we have kind of a real data model behind this which means that um, when you look at the node configuration, the node gets has information on its own. Oh, no, yeah, has configuration. Yeah, no profiles. Yeah, okay, again. It's, so we need to configure the node. So we have to have kind of variables which go to all or just a selection of node and that's called profiles. So that you say, okay, these are the um, nodes which are on this network, so they get this profile attached. Or you have other kind of nodes which just have GPOs, you need some special configuration file for your GPOs, and then you could put them into another profile. Or what kind of things they do. So, and there we have, we can configure several values for every node, which is, for example, the container, which system overlays it should use, what kind of kernel options it should use, the network configuration can be configured then in, in Werewolf, the IPMI configuration, so that you um, always can access the node even if the network is down, so this um, iTrack or how's it, yeah, it's IPMI. 
And you can also have arbitrary key value pairs in Verlof so that, that you can um, use them in your own written templates if you say, okay, I need now this special value for the, that configuration. And also this data has a data inheritance, which means that there are, um, that you do not have to configure every value for every node. So if there is a node value, for example, for the IP address, then it will take that one. If it does not find uh, I, a, a value of something, it will look like in the next upper layer, which is the profile. For example, in a network, you would always, you would only configure the IP address for the node, the, for example, the net mask then, um, and MTU in the profile. So if in the node pro, in the node configuration, there is no MTU or net mask, it will look it up in the, in the profile. And if it doesn't find it out, it will tr it try to um, search a, proper uh, kind of default value, which is then compiled in into Werewolf, which is, for example, the kernel command line or things like this are always in the, um, are the default value. So if you look it through for, for the kernel arcs, it would be that, for example, if you, the default value is always that you, you, not, you do not use a crash kernel because uh, on RAM, this, this would not work out. The, the, um, that we have a proper that uh, the, the VGR option, so that we see properly. And for example, if you want to to see it really booting with all the messages, you would remove the quiet. This would then, for example, be a profile value. And if you node really wants to behave not in a proper way, so no art speed, so often used value there. Now that's now what a node listing, what all the values we can have into Werewolf and how they end up there, how it really looks like. Now, the thing about Werewolf is how we really boot that node um, because that's, that's the whole magic about it. So the first thing we are doing there, we are getting the IPXE binary per TFTP this PXE, IPXE binary is shipped with Werewolf. Then the IPXE boots, gets a dynamic IP address. Then it tries to connect to the Werewolf D daemon. From there, it gets its kernel. It can fetch additional K mods if it's configured in that way. Then it will push the con uh, pull the container, so the operating system of it, and then the system overlay, which is the configuration for all this uh, for for this specific node, and then IPXE builds a magic single big image, and from this image and then it starts to boot it to the kernel with this magic kind of big image, which contains really all the stuff. It's 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 not really a init rd here involved. It's really uh, besides it's the init rd. Um, a value in IPXE, but it's really then booting from this initRD. This is really the complete operating system here. And then the kernel calls init, which is provided as a separate init script in the system overlay. And this is then a sysv like init. And this is just really just used that before we boot the rest of the operating system, we config we can configure here um, the most basic stuff like IPMI with IPMI tool. So that we, if something goes haywork, that we can still access the node. So that's that's um, so. This is the reason why this is happening at this really um, at this early stage. And after that, we have configured IPMI and configured as a Linux. This is the other thing you have to do at the early stage. Um, then you call the normal system to init from the container, and then the container OS simply boots up, hopefully. And then you can simply access the um, the the then WW cleaning, WW client launches, and then it, this downloads then the runtime overlay and does the rest out for the configuration. Um, 
I've talked now about what's now in 4.3. The 4.4 version will be released or hopefully released at Supercompute in November. Plan feature and what's now inside, it's a gRPC and JSON and uh, JSON interface uh, so that you can also configure and get the values out from this kind of net tools. Yeah, possible features which will not go into the next release but are still planned in future releases is a simple disk management and persistent node install. Um, but it's still, uh, this has to be happening in the future. Okay. And yeah, you can always contribute it over GitHub. It's in Leap. It's in Tumbleweed. Yeah. And that's it. So thank you for your attention. And um, if there are any questions, we have time now for this. Nobody hears me. It's after lunch. All are sleeping now. Okay, Christian, thanks for your yeah. talk. And we can just wait a couple of minutes for potential questions. Oh, something in the tab chat. Yeah, how do I see Werewolf and Alp? Andreas is is asking. Um, that's actually a work in progress. So I'm just writing some kind of stuff that we can run Werewolf in a container so that we can deploy it on ALP. I think that's, I will do that now. We, I also um, added stuff that we can boot ALP on the nodes that needed some um, modifications. So because ALP is using the network manager and there was no network configuration in Werewolf yet, which is now in the 4.4 release. So these nodes can be booted per ALP now. Um, I'm also trying to get obtainer into ALP so that you then can boot that one. So it combines kind of very well because um, ALP is also um, a container operating system. Mm, nope. I think we can pull the container image directly from. The thing is, we cannot pull it at the moment because it's just a QCAR2 image, and the QCAR2 image cannot import it directly into Werewolf. It would be nice if we then can also build in SUSE a tarball in as a Docker tarball so that we can pull that one. This would make things much easier, but that's we have to discuss this there.
but there is a kind of way to, you can also import a QCAR2 image into Werewolf if you go uh, with the guest fish tools and copy the image out there, but that's not just a nice way.